Hey everyone, this is the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman and the apologist David Zills is back to join us today. How are you doing today, David? Doing all right. How are you? I'm doing okay. We're settling into routine. Routine is actually, it's not the worst thing. It, it's, I'm a fan. <laughs> yeah, it can get tiring after a while, but then vacation can get tiring too. I, I think it's kind of one of those marks that you might be uh, getting a little bit older is that most of the time when something exciting happens, now you start to dread it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, can understand. I, I understand that. Yeah. Maybe that's, maybe that's just me. Uh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm starting to creep up there. Um, so uh, no, one I of get the it. we get to do uh, is, is we sit down and, and we talk about the defense of the faith. We, we talk about, you know, how to actually look at, at what you believe as if it's actually a real thing and not just a pretend thing. And then how that might, might apply. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. I, I wish that I would have had that when I was a young person a little bit more because um, I had a lot of questions and it took me a little later till I was in college to feel like I started having traction for how to think about, you know, is this real and not just something that's in my head. So yeah, I think it's definitely an important topic. Right. And, and that's, that's sort of a, a baseline too. Is this real or is it just in my head? Because I mean, you can, you can make a claim about an invisible God just about any which way you want to, because invisible right so i can say it rains because god is mad at you um but that's how do you how do you know what's real here like how do we start to think through it in a rational way so that you're going to approach the world in a certain way yeah yeah so i think back last time we were talking about worldviews and tests for worldviews and we talked about two tests a truth test and a meaning test and last time we talked more about meaning which i think is secondary because if something's not true it doesn't matter if it's meaningful because it's it's fake um but if two things could be true then you know the one that's meaningful obviously is preferred but um i think revisiting that truth test is important um because that's the one that matters that determines if something's real and if you know when when the rubber hits the road and life gets tough is it something you can rely on is it something you can depend on or is it all you know mythology and pretend yeah for sure um, so, and this is something that somebody told me, uh, that, uh, it, I was, I was talking with somebody who was very set against faith sort of in general and, and sort of gave us the, the classic, well, how do you know yours is right? After all, um, I choose to believe in Odin because, uh, he has promised to protect us from ice giants and I haven't seen any ice giants. So I, I mean, you see this little internal consistency, but it's not going to line up necessarily with the outside world, is it? Right. So, yeah. So there are two truth tests. One is, is it internally consistent? If something contradicts itself, then you can't believe all of it at the same time because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's in con conflict with itself. But the bigger test is, does it line up with reality, with reality as we know it, you know, as we experience it and have experienced it down through the centuries? So, um, so yeah, that, I think that's the test. And about the, you know, the, the invisible God, and I believe in Odin because no ice giants, you know, I think when people talk about religion, there's kind of this special category of, of worldview, and maybe we should define what a worldview is, but it's like religious worldviews are suspect, but other worldviews aren't. But the fact is, everybody has a worldview, um, and the question is, does it line up with reality? And we can ask that about a religious worldview, we can ask that about a secular worldview, and it's important to do that no matter what your worldview is, to think why do I believe this? How do I know it's real? Um, so yeah, so I mean, what what is a worldview? I think that's an important topic because that is ultimately what apologetics is about is, mm -hmm. you know, which worldview is true. And when we say this, uh, it may not be a word that lots of people are familiar with. And it's basically a comprehensive set of beliefs about reality. Um, so it's about reality. It's about what really is true. Um, and it's a set of beliefs you know, it's what do you think about reality, but it's comprehensive. Um, so in other words, it covers not only what is real, you know, is is chemistry and physics the only real thing and everything else, you know, any supernatural is, is fake, you know, uh, so what is reality? How do we know things? That'd be another subject that worldviews touch. Do we know things only through science? Do we know them only through subjective experience? You know, how do we know things? Another topic would be what is what is the nature of people, of humanity? You know, are we completely bodies and our souls are just 
you know, our consciousness is projected by our brain chemistry, but it's not really anything real by itself. You know, um, are we completely spiritual? You know, there are a lot of worldviews that will claim we're completely spiritual and the, the material world is something that's bad or is an illusion and we should kind of get rid of it. And so that's another topic worldviews would touch. What is, uh, what is morality? You know, what, yeah. what, sh how should we live? Is there even a should at all? So some worldviews would say there is no should. You know, if you believe that science is all that is the only way to know knowledge, then science cannot tell you whether it's good or bad morally to kill someone and under what circumstances killing may be justified or not. You know, how would you experiment that? How would you, how would you instrument that experiment to be like, okay, we killed them this way under these circumstances and our magic morality meter said, Ooh, that was a sin, you know, or non-religious people wouldn't use the word sin. They'd say it was, you know, it was, it was something wrong. You did something wrong. Um, you know, you can, science can't talk about that. So if you believe that science is really all there is, then you can't believe in morality. And then where does that get you? You know, but a lot of people intuitively believe in morality, but how do you construct it? Where does it come from? What is good? What is evil? What is the ultimate good? You know, that kind of everything else derives from. So worldviews are these ideas about all these categories, reality, knowledge, human nature, morality, life after death, you could go on and on. And it's this comprehensive set of beliefs about what is real, you know, all over. And so some examples of morality of worldviews that we've already touched on would be like scientific naturalism, the idea that the material world is all there is, therefore all only the only valid knowledge comes through science therefore morality is an illusion consciousness is an illusion anything supernatural isn't real and therefore there is no life after death therefore there is no god therefore there is no meaning so that would be an example of a worldview um, another one would be you know like in in the eastern world you could say you know on the opposite side the only thing that's real is the spiritual and anything physical is an illusion and any distinctions that we might find in logic or morality or between persons are an illusion. And the way to find meaning is to escape these illusions and get in touch with the universal soul, where we kind of get um, embedded back into this universal soul. And that's the goal of life. Um, you know, very different. So obviously there's, there's, there's a lot of variety in worldviews and, you know, we could invent one about, you know, ice giants and, or, you know, atheists like to talk about God as if, you know, he's the flying spaghetti monster, you know, of course you can make up any, anything you want, but the question is, how do you know if it corresponds to reality? Right. And I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, even sort of looking at sort of the, the scientific naturalism, there, there's an internal consistency, I, I, I suppose, um, in, in ways, except they have to keep revisiting the science as they make new discoveries. But I mean, at least they're willing to adjust it so that it remains more or less consistent. But you can look to the outside world and there are still questions. Yeah. So, you know, one, one thing that's hard for scientific naturalism is we all intuitively think that love is real that morality is real, that there are things that are good and things that are evil. But if, you know, science is all there is in the material world, then you, we have no way to make sense of these. So there's kind of this intuition in us that doesn't correspond with reality. Now, the scientific answer to that would be those intuitions are products of our brain chemistry and you can't trust them, you know? So, you know, there, there are ways to incorporate these, um, these tensions back into the worldview. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, with Christianity, I think we can treat it like any other worldview. We can subject it to the same tests that we would scientific naturalism, Eastern Hinduism, you know, postmodernism, any of these things, we use the same tests. And so it's a fair playing field. And the question is, which one stacks up best against the facts? So we're not saying you're a Christian, so just be a Christian because you were a Christian, but we're saying subjected to the same reality that you would the, the flying spaghetti monster. And here it's actually kind of a good thing because then you get to actually sit down with the people who struggle with the faith and even mock it and say, all right, like, we'll, we'll hold yours to the same standard that we hold mine, but let's actually just, let's ask fair questions. Yeah, no, I think that's completely fair. And, you know, sometimes it can feel like if we start to question the faith, we're sinning and we're not being good Christians. But um, if you look in the Bible, there are tons of people who ask questions mm -hmm. and God is the God who meets us there and provides us with the answers. You know, I don't think he would give us a desire for a confident faith that stands up to critical thinking and then say, well, but you just have to leap in the dark, you know? So there's this idea that, um, 
you know, God is this invisible thing and therefore you cannot subject it to tests, rational tests. You cannot, you know, how do you test if it's real? He's invisible. You just kind of have to believe. It's just this blind faith. And uh, biblically, I don't think that's the kind of faith God calls people to in the Bible. God is always calling people to respond in faith to his revealing of himself and showing himself faithful. And so there's a record of his faithfulness through through the ages. And that record is either reliable or it's not. If it's not, then it's mythology and we might as well throw it away with the Greek gods and goddesses. But if it does stand up to historical tests, then maybe this is a God we can have confidence that, you know, he will be there when we need him to be there. So you, you kind of mentioned historical tests. Could you give me a couple examples inside of Christianity then? Point me to something real. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the idea there is that Christianity is not ultimately a, a ethical system. It's not primarily a abstract system. It's about a historical reality that God did things in history, that he revealed himself to Moses, to the prophets, and ultimately that he became a man in Jesus. So I think as Christians, the best apologetics point to who Jesus is and ask the question, who is Jesus and what does the historical data say about that? And are the Christian claims about Jesus, do they line up with the historical um, data or not? And so I, I'm saying historical data. What does that mean? Are we talking about archaeology? Are we saying, you know, forensic scientists are going to go in there and get a hair from Jesus and do the DNA test and show he was really born of a virgin and that his other, you know, his Y chromosome came super. I mean, you know, what, what are we talking about here? So historical data comes in three kinds. Um, typically, um, they're categorized as um, oral testimony, written testimony, and artifacts. Are those? That's one way to categorize. So oral oral testimony is people who, who say, I saw these things, I witnessed these things, or my grandfather or my grandfather's grandfather experienced these things in his life and this really happened. Um, obviously, when we go back to the time of Jesus, we're not going to have a lot of oral history because it's been a long time and we don't have people whose grandfather's grandfathers walked with the apostle John, although we do have writings of those people, which is interesting. We can come back to that. Um, but the next top is written history. And this is the one we'll focus on primarily when we talk about ancient history. It's people who experienced things and wrote things down. And we have these writings, or at least copies of these writings. And we can say, are the copies of these writings, were they reliably preserved going back to the time they were originally written, you know, as people copied them to preserve them because, you know, manuscripts rot and stuff. So, so are the, were the words reliably transmitted through the centuries? And when they were written, were the people who wrote them down, were they in the know? Did they know things or were they just talking about hearsay or were they inventing up fairy tales? You know, so we can test the witnesses kind of the same way we would in a court of law when someone comes up and they say, I saw the murder and this is who the murderer is. We don't just go around and say, okay, you know, hmm. you know, put it, send them to prison. We say, well, we, we cross-examine and we we check against other witnesses and we do all these things. And these are the same kinds of things we can do with historical witnesses as they have written down their testimony. And then the third uh, category is artifacts. And this one's tricky. It can be helpful, but it's not the primary one. For example, if you find this oddly shaped porcelain bowl, you might say, you know, a hundred 2000 years from now, you might say, hmm, that's a weird thing to cook in, but it has this weird plumbing that goes in the back. And it's like they were trying to get rid of something. I wonder what they were trying to get rid of. And, you know, there's all this room for interpretation, whereas someone who actually lived there would write down, this is a toilet. This is how we use it. You know, so <laughs> so written testimony is much more specific. Artifacts, there's room to kind of say, well, how did they use this? What's What does this mean? What does this tell us? You know, and there's room okay. for interpretation. But sometimes artifacts can be helpful. For example, there have been a lot of inscriptions that have confirmed that very peculiar wording for how uh, Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke and Acts, that he would call rulers certain names. And for a long time, historians were like, that type of ruler never existed. But then 
they'd find some inscription in the dirt in the place that Luke was describing from the period Luke was describing. And it used that very odd term for the rulers. And they were like, huh, maybe Luke knew what he was talking about. And so art artifacts can be helpful, but we'll primarily focus on written testimony and subject it to the tests that all written documents of history are subjected to, to see, you know, did these things really happen the way they're described? Sure, sure. And then when you start to apply that, then you can actually address it to, to the common problems that the, the worldview is proposedly confronting. Um, so even then, like I, I look back um, and I recognize uh, the, the person I was sort of um, going round about with, with Odin, um, he was inventing a problem to solve it. And then I guess it's really easy because there's no real place to sort of find that problem in the world. But I can, I can confront a problem like death, for example, um, everywhere. Um, so what is your world you have to say about that? And, and is it internally and externally consistent then? Right, right. And uh, you know, with death, we'll come back to that because you know, that's something we all worry about um, mm. for obvious reasons. Um, and, you know, if I'm going to follow someone who says this is the solution to death, you know, I think the person that would have the most credibility would be someone who's died and has come back on the other side. I feel like they would have, you know, the most credibility to know, you know to, to what they say. And so the, the, the Christian claim is that in history, Jesus rose from the dead. And that may sound like mythology, but the fact is there are historical records that even the most secular and non-Christian scholars have said, you know, certain ground, um, certain bedrock claims related to the resurrection stand up to historical scrutiny. And there have been Christian scholars that have said, let's look at this bedrock that, you know, everyone agrees on because the evidence is so strong. And how do you make sense of it? And usually the best way to make sense of it is that Christians were right when they said Jesus is risen. Right. So I, I, this is an important thing then, that, that you're actually allowed to sort of uh, test what you believe against the rest of reality, and it should hold up. Yeah, yeah. If it doesn't, then, you know, you've got a problem because, you know, reality ultimately wins in the end. You know, when you jump out of a plane, you may have a lot of faith that you don't need a parachute. You know, and you might be completely convinced, but at the end of the day, reality will take over and you will have consequences. And so testing our beliefs against reality is what gives us the most confidence that when crises come, you know, the parachute will be there, so to speak, or, or whatever the, whatever the case is, you know, we can have confidence that we're not, you know, running against reality and that that will come back to bite us at some point. I love it. So that's, those are sort of important things. Uh, anything else you kind of want to add to that today? No, I think, uh, I think this is a great start to investigating the historical claims of Christianity, kind of lay the groundwork, but there's a lot more we can explore in, in coming sessions. Looking forward to it. David Zills, thanks so much for joining us today. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Harrison.